All right, we'll get our Bibles together tonight, and uh, let's open them to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. We're going to kind of go back and forth between 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles a little bit for this message because there's some details to interject in regards to how the kings uh, fit into and what has happened to the, the separate kings from the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, okay? Last uh, three messages on Wednesday night, we focused on Asa, a good king until the very end, kind of like Solomon of the southern kingdom of Israel. Now we kind of have to fill in some gaps. Remember, he reigned for 41 years, so in the process of those 41 years, there were a few kings that came and went um, in the northern kingdom after all of that time. So uh, we kind of begin in Second Chronicles, and then we'll flip back and forth uh, then into First Kings and see what's going on there. You know, anytime we, as God's people, attempt to make this world our everything, it seems to fall apart. I don't know if you've realized that or noticed that to be the case in your life. I have definitely noticed that to be the case in my life. Anytime that my plans seem to be put as the first priority, my plans don't always seem to match up with God's plan. And when that is the situation, man, it's just miserable. And so it is vital for us to always seek to make our plan God's plan, to follow Him exclusively, and also to not put so much stock in this world. That's a, such a hard thing to do, because the world is something we can see and touch and taste and smell, and, and eternity is something that's out there and is such a mystery, and we take it by faith, and so we do... Uh, know that someday our faith will become sight, but it's so tempting to make our sight what we do and, and, and where we act and where we put all of our, if you want to look at it, putting all of our eggs in the sight basket rather than in the faith basket. And because of that, you know, we'll, we'll put way too much emphasis on the things of this world if we're not careful. It's a temptation for us for sure to... Um, uh, do the things that we can see in this world and try to make it what it is not, and that is heaven. Then, when the walls come crumbling down on what we have tried to create, our life just gets nasty, to use a term that we'll all understand. Before us, what we have uh, in the reign of Jeroboam and then in the reign of his son and ultimately uh, the next king afterwards, is we have lives that are crumbling down. Uh, defeat has defined the end of Jeroboam's reign as king of Israel. And that is to be expected when he decided that he would go the way of the world. And he would set up the golden calves, remember, in Bethel, and in Dan, the two areas that he said to the northern kingdom, these are your gods, you will go and worship them now. And he set up these two golden calves, two of them, in the nation, and they just went nuts. And they started focusing their whole attention on the, the ways of the world, the gods of the world, and the and the uh, beliefs of the world and the northern kingdom went down the tubes very quickly under the reign of Jeroboam. At the hand of Abijah, this was a southern king, a king of Judah, also known as Abijam, he suffered, or Jeroboam suffered greatly. So the remaining couple of years of his life uh, and his reign as king Everything he had built the previous 20 years began to just come undone. Second Chronicles 13 verse 14 tells us about this. When Judah looked back and saw the, the uh, uh, big army of the northern kingdom of Jeroboam, Behold, the battle was before and behind. They cried to the Lord. The priests sounded with trumpets, and the men of Judah gave a shout. 
The men of Judah shouted, and as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah the king and Judah the southern kingdom. And the children of Israel, that's Jeroboam's army, fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. Man, we're talking about a civil war here. So there fell down slain of Israel, the northern kingdom, 500,000 chosen men. Not just any men, but chosen men. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, or subdued. And the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel and the towns thereof, and Jeshana with the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. Neither did Now this is the key here. Verse 20 says, Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again after this happened. Man, I'm telling you, this is just a horrific defeat late in the life of Jeroboam as he watched everything that he had built come crumbling down. 500,000 of his chosen men, his best men, his greatest army, coming against the, the tiny little nation of Judah and King Abijah, who, by the way, just had this glowing moment in life himself, and, and man, they are just having a horrible time watching as even their cities, their capital cities, come crumbling down around them because Abijah and his army relied on the Lord and called upon the Lord and Jeroboam was trying to use every bit of his strength to serve himself and what he thought was right and do the things that he thought would build up his own kingdom. And he had done a pretty good job of it up to this point. But as Numbers tells us, be careful because your sins will find you out. And so uh, it, is, it is something to watch and it's very sad because Jeroboam actually got off to a pretty good start in life. But unfortunately it didn't end very well. And uh, things didn't go so well. Of course, with this, this huge army defeat or, or military defeat you add then the sorrow of the loss of his son as a young child who died according to the word of ahijah the prophet okay not the king abijah but ahijah the prophet why do you ever notice why so many biblical names are similar and and by the way when you notice that it's usually there's some there's some uh, uh, definitions around those names that you get. Ahijah is the prophet, okay? Abijah was the king, and he was the son of so and so and so and so. Why do you think the Bible does that? Because they want last names. I mean, or that is their last name. And so don't just skip over that thinking, man, the Bible's just too wordy. There's a reason why there's some, some defining going on. So Ahijah was the prophet, and uh, he prophesied that Jeroboam's son, his child, would die. Remember, he had his wife disguise herself, and Ahijah had gotten really old and couldn't see anyway. It didn't matter what she looked like when she got there, and she brought in all sorts of common food to not uh, give it away that this was kingly food that she was taking as a goodie basket for him, and Ahijah, as soon as uh, she walked in the door, the Lord had already told her that he was, she was coming. And when she got there, she said, uh, you know, he basically said, what are you doing here, queen? <laughs> I mean, just blew the whole surprise, didn't he? Uh, no fun to try to pull a surprise on a prophet, by the way. I mean, God kind of showed the, you know, showed the hand, and, and he said and gave her very specific things that were going to happen to Jeroboam, and one of them was that he was ha he, his child that was sick was going to die, and he did. So everything Jeroboam had been setting up was coming apart. The child's death was not the only consequence Jeroboam faced, because of his disobedience to God, great trouble in paradise stayed on the horizon for him. 
And this is where we go back to 1 Kings chapter 14. All right, just a couple of books back to 1 Kings chapter 14. When you get there, find verse 7 and following. So 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse number 7. Uh, by the way, the son of Jeroboam was also named Abijah. Weird, huh? How that just continues to kind of kind of happen. So uh, uh, this is the visit with the prophet that uh, Jeroboam's wife is having. And so the prophet Ahijah tells his wife in verse 7, Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to you, and yet thou hast not as my servant David, or has not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all of his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes. But thou hast done evil, above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Verse 10 says, Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam, and I will cut off from Jeroboam all of the males, is what that means. Again, I didn't read that last time. I just don't like that word. And him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung or cleans up the pig pen till it all be gone. I mean, man, verse 10 is just one of those verses that you go, whoa, God means business here. And of course, we know this, and this is where our handout starts tonight, and you can start filling in the blanks. Uh, this is where the prophet's words come into play. The prophet's words come into action. Um, man, it's hard to miss, uh, construe what the prophet said, isn't it? I mean, he just went right down to the nuts and bolts of things. And he said, this is, this is uh, what's going to happen, and this is why it's going to happen. And the why of the reason that it happened is certainly something we need to pay attention to. Because when we start to build up our own kingdoms and think that this earth is heaven and treating it that way, God's got to get our attention if we're His people. I mean, He's just a, he's just a good God to do that. And so it is vitally important for us to hear and translate those words in that manner so the prophet's words can actually speak to us too. You see, we can be certain Jeroboam did not expect such harsh news. Why do I know that to be true? Otherwise, he would not send his wife to the prophet. Man, he thought the prophet was going to give him some, oh, your child's going to be okay, and, and the kingdom's going to be okay, and everything's going to be okay. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that preach that gospel today. Can I just be honest with you? There's a lot of people just say, hey, you're okay, I'm okay, you know, whatever, you, whatever feels good to you, you just do it. But that's just not true, because the Bible tells us that there are many things in this world we need to stay away from. Sanctification is still a major doctrine of the Bible. Sanctification means to be set apart for a holy purpose, set apart for a godly purpose, to do what is God's will, to not build our, our kingdoms on the earth, but to build our kingdom in heaven and to care about what God cares about, not what the flesh cares about. And so we see that the prophet's words are something he didn't expect because, because he would not have sent his wife to hear that news. Let's just be honest, right? I mean, if you knew the prophet was going to give you bad news, you wouldn't go see the prophet. I mean, that's just human nature. And so he didn't expect this. But it's funny how we get all caught up in our own little world, isn't it? It's funny how, how we, just let, we just think that, that everything is great and, and boy, this sickness can't be God's judgment and, and judgment shows up in a lot of different ways. 
And we do need to pay attention when, when harsh things are going on around us. What is God doing? Is it because of something that, that I'm, I'm not following the Lord like I should be? Is this, is this a consequence or is this a test? I mean, we need to identify that very quickly when things are getting harsh around us. Okay? Is this a consequence? So do I need to repent of something or is it a test? If it's a test, then the Lord said he's not going to put more on you than you can handle. And he's going to walk with you and your faith is going to be strengthened through that time of testing. Please know that. But it is funny how Jeroboam's kind of all caught up in his own little world and he sends his wife just, ah, you know, maybe the, maybe the uh, prophet will give her a little, you know, mixture of something. He can drink it and be okay. But that's not what happened, is it? The prophet said, man, your son's going to die. That's what's going to happen. And this is the reason why. Jeroboam had filled his life with his own ways of doing things. It's funny how we can do the same thing. Jeroboam had filled his life with his own ways of doing things. You, you've, you've heard that often. You know, we here in West Texas are very much people who like to, you know, it, it, when the tough gets going, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You know, just tie your bootstraps on just a little tighter. All those sayings that we use around here, you know, we're just a tough and rugged people. But deep down, man, we're pretty vulnerable. And we're pretty soft, even if we don't really want to admit that to just everybody. Jeroboam thought he had it all, man. And uh, when he hears these prophets' words, I'm not sure how he reacted to them because the Bible doesn't record that, but it had to have been a punch in the gut for sure. Because Jeroboam had filled his life with his own ways of doing things. So I tell you this, if nothing else from Jeroboam, and I know we're backtracking just a little bit because we've already kind of studied this, but I just want to remind you that we need to learn from his mistakes. We need to learn from his mistakes. Why do you think the Bible records the life of Jeroboam as much as is in the Bible? So that we can read it and we can learn from his mistakes. That's what we need to do. And man, I'm telling you, I love the Old Testament because of all of the, the individual examples of good and bad so that I can learn from those things. And Jeroboam is a guy that we can learn from his mistakes. And we need to, okay? When we attempt, you see, to do things our own way trouble inevitably ensues so as with the prophet's words sometimes god has to clean the pen out of all of the refuse that's in it verse 10 the way it ends man as a man taketh away the dung till it all be gone god has to clean out the pig pen from time to time I use that illustration not because of uh, it's not kosher, but because of the prodigal son. And I think hopefully when you hear the pig pen, most of the time you don't think of uh, Matt Polnack and you know his pig business, but you think of you think of the prodigal son and where he ended up. You know where did he end up in the pig pen? What did he smell like when he hugged his father for the first time in forever, or his father hugged him? He still smelled like the pig pen. But his father still hugged him, didn't he? Still gave him his robe, still gave him his ring, still brought him home and killed the fatted calf and had a, had a nice celebration with everybody because his son that had been lost is now found, according to what the Bible tells us. And so sometimes, just like the prophet says, man, the pig pen needs to get cleaned out. Our lives get full of such mire and muck that they need to be cleaned out. The Holy Spirit is our cleansing agent. He is the one who convicts. He's the one who tells us. He's, and then we confess our sins. The Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can clean out the pig pen for us. All right? So that's important. The prophet's words is what we see first. But then we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, you go back over there, 2 Chronicles chapter 13, we see the king's wars, okay? The king's wars in Second Chronicles chapter 13 and verse number 20. I read just a brief portion of this, 
uh, verse to you a minute ago in the uh, process of the first reading. But in verse 20 of 2 Chronicles, you see the king's wars. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. You so, see, Jeroboam trudged on through life even after that harsh message that he received from the prophet. Jeroboam trudged on, man. He, he lived a couple more years after this huge defeat from the army of Abijah. He trudged on through life after the death of a child. And uh, <clears throat> that is something that I personally have not experienced. But it is every parent's worst nightmare. And I do know this, that I have known people who have lost children. And it is something that I know you just don't get over very easily, if ever. And so Jeroboam had to just trudge on in life through the loss of his child and then knowing after he heard from the prophet, the prophet's words, knowing that it was likely his own fault that he died. What a burden to bear. And that's why it's amazing to me that Jeroboam was able just to continue to trudge on and not repent of his ways. Are you kidding me? Talk about stubborn and rebellious. But can't we put ourselves in Jeroboam's shoes when we're stubborn and rebellious against what God is trying to lead us to do? I mean, man, he still trudged on. Is that you today? Are you still just trying to trudge on even though you know God is trying to lead you in a direction to teach you something and maybe get you to repent of something? Jeroboam was still trying to get things done his own way. His way. You've heard the old saying, his way or the highway. That was Jeroboam, man. He was stubborn about it. The consequence of his child's death evidently did not make, make much of an impact. That's very sad. He was then resistant to God. Man, I pray that that would not be the case for us. You know, if the Lord's, if the Lord's moving in your heart about something and, and dealing with you about something and you know something's going on as a consequence, it's time to deal with it, you know? No time like the present. Again, don't try to get things done your own way. Note what's going on. Don't be resistant to God. It's at this point, I believe, that when we see consequences, it's at this point that we can actually turn our back on God and blame Him. You know? In a way that says, hey, you know, um, I don't deserve this. I don't, uh, you know, all of those types of things. And man, the enemy really gets in there and starts, starts you know, it's tightening down the screws on us there, saying, yeah, you know, that, you, that God is really love, isn't he? He's all about love. Well, you know, love sometimes has a discipline involved with it. You know, I, I mean, I, I loved my kids enough to discipline them. Is that, is that not true? I mean, hopefully you love your kids enough to discipline them. And God, our, our righteous and holy and perfect heavenly Father, knows exactly how to discipline us. And he is always going to discipline us righteously. You know, i got to admit to you, I didn't always discipline my kids righteously. Can I get an amen to that? I, I mean, I didn't always. I, was, I had to admit there were some times I was angry. And the Bible tells, tells us not to be angry when we're disciplining our kids. That was tough from time to time because, man, I don't know about you, but I've, I've, I have kids that uh, could knew exactly which button to push and pushed it often. You know, I mean, yeah, it's like a constant ding, 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 and, and it just, ah, and then you get angry, and then you just, ah, you know, I wasn't always the perfect, righteous, earthly father, but we have a righteous, heavenly father who always disciplines us correctly, exactly as we need it, and 
unfortunately we don't take that discipline we start blaming god we start asking god why and we start start then distancing ourselves from god pushing ourselves away from his loving embrace can i tell you something about my earthly dad my earthly dad and i have always had kind of a weird relationship i'll just be honest with you i mean he's very mechanical and i'm not i was at least a good gopher can I get an amen to that? I mean, I at least knew what the tools were, you know. I, I mean, he taught me well there, but as far as screwing in a screw in the wall or hammering a hammer or something like that, man, I'm Ned in the first reader. I just, I, I don't get that. I, I, it's, um, I can do it, but it's just hard for me. And so we've always kind of had a different relationship. But I, and I remember my dad uh giving me punishment as a kid and spanking me and and um and i always deserved it by the way i am be the first to admit i deserved it but here's the other thing that i do remember always about my dad is my dad would always come in after the tears were kind of beginning to diminish and he'd come in and he would hug me and you know, I've got to be honest with you, my dad's still not the most affectionate person in the world, and, and, and if you ever see him here and I hug my dad, it's always just a little bit awkward. I, I don't know why that is. I, I never wanted hugs with my kids to be awkward, you know? But it just kind of is, I, I don't know, it's just kind of one of those things. But I'll always remember the hugs my dad gave me after the whippings that I deserved and i didn't push my dad away and i don't hate him to this day because he punished me i didn't like him very much at the time you know that's just an earthly human reaction but deep down i knew i deserved it and so i didn't push him away sometimes i think we push god away when he begins to punish us when, when there's some consequences to our sin that we're involved with and rather than push him away, let's receive the hug that he wants to give us, you know. Let's get close to him. Let's draw. You remember the Bible says in the book of James, chapter 4, draw nigh, draw near unto God, and he'll draw nigh or near unto you. And that, it, I believe, is a promise that also remains for us when there's consequences to our sin. And we come back and we say, God, I'm sorry. And he just wants to reach out and bring us in close again. Something that unfortunately didn't happen in Jeroboam's life. And man, when verse 20 of Second Chronicles 13 says, Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again. Man, I just have to hear that and go, Oh man, that's not the way I want my life to be lived. I don't want to live life like that. Again, because the enemy can confuse our minds and make us think that God is mean, unfair toward us, rather than being the righteous Heavenly Father that He is. So rather than turn to God and repent, we get bitter. We push Him away. Inevitably, we, like Jeroboam, try to do the best we can for ourselves. Well, that God guy, man, he just doesn't care. So we just try to do the best for ourselves. This happens until our strength wears away. And that's what the Bible says, man. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again. His strength ultimately wore away just like ours will. And is that the kind of, is that the kind of people we want to be? I don't want to be that way, you know? So ultimately, all of this transpired and created back in 1 Kings, now chapter 14, it transpired and built towards the son's woes. Jeroboam had a son that would take over as king. And in 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse number 20, we see, and the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his stead. Now flip over to chapter 15 and verse 25. Chapter 15 and verse 25, and Nadab the son of Jeroboam began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king.
king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, Jeroboam, and in the sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. And Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, okay, was the prophet's name Ahijah? It was, wasn't it? Why does then the Bible clarify that Ahijah was of the house of Issachar? Because it's not the same guy. Man, did everybody just get named John for a whole generation? You know, I mean, it's kind of like that in the Bible too, all right? Evidently, Ahijah was the number one name in the year, you know, 1300 B.C. or whatever it was at this particular time. It wasn't quite that long ago, but, but uh, you know what I'm saying. So, uh, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha smote him killed him, Nadab, um, at Gibbethon, which belongeth to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. So Baasha, friendly fire, snuck up behind him and killed him. By the way, just as Ahijah the prophet had told him it would happen. This had already been prophesied. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, verse 28 says, did Baasha slay him and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam. Remember what the prophet said? I'm going to cut off all the males in your lineage. So Baasha smote, killed all the house of Jeroboam. He left not Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord which he spake by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite, the prophet, because of the sins of Jeroboam which he sinned and which he made Israel sin, and by his provocation wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger crazy now the rest of the acts of nadab and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles the kings of israel so you see the son's woes now i want you to note this very closely before we get on to filling out and finishing up our our uh, uh, process tonight please note it is not always that a dad's sin is passed down to the son or the consequences of a dad's sin is passed down to the son. Okay? That does not always happen. In fact, Ezekiel talks about the fact that each generation is responsible for itself. Okay? So that is not always the case. Please don't take this as the law always. The prophet had already said, Jeroboam, because of what's going on in your life, it is going to affect the next generation. And it did. In this situation, then, we just have to know that it had to be this way. It had to be that way. It had to be that way because God's prophet spoke it, showed up in God's word. If, if the prophet would have said it and it didn't happen, then it wouldn't have been God's word, right? I mean, that kind of makes a simple truth to it, but it did have to be this way. So, let's fill, finish filling out our, our uh, uh, paper tonight. So, Nadab then ultimately was in the bullseye of Jeroboam's sin. Pretty sad to say this, but we have to note that the Bible records that he did sin just exactly like his dad did, right? So we have to note that he didn't attempt to follow God. I mean, Nadab didn't do anything about following the Lord, and he had some good examples in his not-too-far rearview mirror with Solomon and David and he could have looked across the border and seen Asa. Asa was serving the Lord and they were having success in the temple and worship and things like that. His ways, though, were, unfortunately, like father, like son. Therefore, his ways did not allow for any grace or mercy from God to be shown. Likely, he, like his dad Jeroboam, 
just attempted to make this world his heaven. So in that way, he followed right in his dad's footsteps, and it proved fatal. Now, it is likely that all of us have attempted to make this earth heaven from time to time. We've attempted to build something or put too much stock in earthly relationships or attached ourselves to something of this world way too much. Have you experienced something like this? Have you experienced something like that crumble? What was your response? What could have Jeroboam done? Man, if he got that message from, from his wife through the prophet and his son ended up, you know, I mean, he could have turned to the Lord at that point. Should have. It's easy for us to look back and say, man, things would have been a lot different. Probably for Jeroboam if he would have. But he didn't. You see, if we learn from the examples set before us in the Bible and from our own mistakes, we will set our hearts and our minds or our affection on the things above, according to Colossians 3.2. It is in this manner that we will find the right relationship with God who can set those affections straight. Unlike Jeroboam and Nadab. And the consequences we see. Next week, it's Baasha. And we'll study together more of King Me next week. Lord, we love you. And thank you so much for your love and your care and your compassion for us. Thank you again for your glorious, your amazing word that we can study together and we can learn from together. Lord, I pray tonight we learn from the mistakes see our lives very clearly through the lens of your word and through what happened in Jeroboam and Jeroboam's family. Thank you, Lord, for what you'll do and for how you'll use your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.